Welcome back to the Barbin Podcast. I am joined here with Barbin's head editor and founder, David Thomas Tao, and then my friend, Elgin Loki, who runs the popular Instagram page, Physique. He is very well versed in getting messages across in the fitness space with imagery and stoked to have you in the office. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. Um, so we've been friends for a while now. Yes. And something that always kind of perplexes me that I want to ask you more on is the difference in Elgin's from Italy how you guys approach fitness and how kind of fitness professionals go about their profession versus like how it is in the US. So I guess my first question for you, man, is when it comes to like getting certified in personal training or working as a fitness professional in Italy, like how do you go about that? And like, what's the normal processes? I think um, it's very similar to the US. There are a couple of courses that you can follow. There are even daily courses that you can do, but most people do the course there last a couple of months, which I think is very similar to here. There's even ACE or uh, ISSA there too. So I think it's the same, although many people just want to get it really fast and do the just weekend type of thing, just to get the certification and just get to work, which isn't a good thing because that's when most myths develop then. And then it's a struggle to unlearn them and teach them the opposite that may be the truth. So I'm not saying that it's harmful for people, but still not everybody is uh, trying to get an evidence-based approach to it. They just want to get it as soon as they can just to start working. Yeah, yeah. I think that's something we, we see in the United States as well. First off, meeting you in person, this is the first time we've met in person, I just assumed your name was Physique. For really? a long time, yeah. When when Jake last week said, "Oh, Eugene's coming by the office," it took me a second to be like, "I don't, I don't know, I don't know who." Oh, physique. Oh, <laughs> M- Mr. Physique. Um, Do you know what physique means? You're gonna have to explain it to me. Okay. Basically, it's a pun made of the words easy and physique. Okay. So instead of spelling physique p h y s i q u e, you spell it with the easy in the middle, because it stands basically for the meaning of my page, which is explaining fitness stuff in an easy way to understand it. So I think that's my strongest point because it can connect many people, uh, those that are coming from a academic background and even those who just want to get, I don't know, a strong body mm-hmm. or leaner or whatever, mm-hmm. or just learn about it. Mm-hmm. That's um, basically a point of convergence, I would say, in my page. One going back to what we were talking about and Jake's question about uh, fitness training and certification in Italy. Yes, I'm curious because we were talking before this recording. I lived in Italy in 2010 for a bit, and I remember at the time it was before, right before I think CrossFit really took off in Europe in a big way internationally. It was something I'd heard of in the U.S. I wasn't actively involved in it at the time, but I had heard of it in the U.S. in, tw- in 2010, and in Italy, it. It didn't really exist, right? I even remember remember looking for a CrossFit box mm-hmm. in Rome because I was like, oh, maybe I can go do some like deadlifts or something there. It'd be like an easy gym to find because it was during the summer and a lot was closed. Yeah. What is the state of that now in Italy? Because it changed so much of how people interact with strength training in the United States. Did it do the same in Italy and does it continue to do so today? You mean uh, on CrossFit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a growth mm-hmm. for the sport. Uh, multiple gyms now offer those packages where you can do CrossFit by itself. And yeah, it's definitely growth grown uh, over the past years. Interesting. Yeah. So like speaking of strength sports though, like what is the gym culture like there in general? Does it vary depending on where you go or is there kind of like an all in one kind of mentality towards health and fitness? Like how did that, how is that prioritized for you guys and what's the culture like? So just, I I believe uh, like the U S uh, powerlifting has been picking up over the past few years. While earlier there were very few competitions, while now it's become more prominent. And I think it's the same, probably due to such social media and stuff. But back in the days, I would say uh, it's mostly a bodybuilding and just hypertrophy training. And yeah, it's mostly bodybuilding. Interesting. The gyms um, are closer to the, not the center, like 
close to the Colosseum, you would find maybe uh, very few gyms. In fact, many people that come in Rome have to look for a gym because they don't know where to go. So most gyms are outside of the center. You can obviously still find them, but they're mostly on the, I would say, periferia in Italian. Uh, I'm lacking the word in English. Yeah, the periphery of the <laughs> yeah. city. Yeah, the, okay. the, the outer ring of the, the suburbs, city. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I remember when I when I was in Rome, I uh, lifted for a bit at uh, the Borgo Prati, I see. Uh, which was like a weightlifting and powerlifting gym. They had like a general gym, but it was it was basically for weightlifters and powerlifters. So it's like what we call in the United States a barbell club, yeah. which is something that's a lot more popular now because of CrossFit. A lot of CrossFit gyms have converted to, to powerlifting and weightlifting, or they open that separately. But at the time, it was this really very old school like weightlifting and powerlifting gym. And I just remember on the walls, I think it's still there, but I remember on the walls, there were pictures of like Italian American heroes. So it was like Sylvester Stallone and like yeah, all of these celebrities that we'd see on the, on the walls. And I was like, Oh, okay. Like some things don't change. Cause I go into American gyms that's and I true. see the same photo. So I, I was like, that's there, really cool. There's some pride to it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So going off of kind of that first question, when it comes to like, let's say I'm going to Italy and I want to have a personal trainer, how do you go about finding that? Is it the same in the US where you just go to a gym and they have like a staff of personal trainers or do they have remote trainers there? Because here in New York City, it's very big to have like more of like your boutique trainers that can travel to you or you mm -hmm. go to their private gyms. Like how is that in Italy? It's up to the gym owner himself. So if there's a gym that has like a package of uh, personal trainers that you get booked with one, but there are gyms that, can have remote personal trainers as well. It's really up to the business uh, really of cool. the gym. Yeah, that's really cool. So, like, when you dove into training folks a little bit more hands-on, like, how did you get into that? Because do you do most of your stuff remote? Yeah, at the moment, yes, I do. But I first started like my first personal training experience was uh, without actually a background because um, there was this guy that I met on a supermarket. He was. Uh, asking me, why are you buying all these eggs? Are you making like a cake or something? I'm like, and I'm like, no, but I need protein. And from there, it just started picking up. And he was like, would you be my coach if I signed up? I had no background in personal training. But I said, yes, why not? It cannot be that difficult. But yeah, from there, it started. Um, I taught him uh, what I knew back in the days. I certainly wasn't that good back yet back then yet but I grew up and learned a lot of things but that taught me that I really love doing that and teaching people how to move and how to exercise and what to train and what exercises to do based on the goal of the person and that allowed me to then pursue my certification and just get better at it yeah I think I honestly I think that's very common here too mm -hmm. and David I think you would agree is like a lot of professionals in the space get into it kind of accidentally at times. Mm. And I think those are the, usually the people that stick in it the most because when you accidentally stumble into it and your friends are like, hey, train me, train me. And like, I think we all kind of had that when you're very active. Your friends are like, hey, he knows what he's kind of doing. I'm going to follow what he does. And then as you train them, you realize that you love it more. And then you start really learning. And then once you open that can, you're like, wow, I know nothing. Exactly. And then you start learning and improving. But I think it's almost can be the opposite effect for people who think like personal training or training others is like this glorified, like this is easy. You're going to make money doing it. The people who go into it for that reason, right off the bat without having that kind of like almost indirect exposure, mm -hmm. they're the ones who burn out because they don't necessarily understand what it all entails and how personal training can be a grind sometimes, especially it when is. it comes to like, if you think it's like the quick fix for a career, you know? Yeah. I think, um, the best part about it is when people just start training and do it consistently and they love it. And then they get asked or approached from people because they notice how consistent you are with your training and maybe the results that you're getting compared to the other people. So while you're just a trainee and you don't know whether you're able to teach it or not, when they approach you and ask you for the question, then you're put into the place where you test whether you like doing it or not. And depending on the results that you get from it, you obviously will learn. It's a learning experience. But then it makes sense to maybe pursue a career there because at least now you know whether you enjoy doing it or not. Well, instead, if you're somebody who's, who doesn't even train and just looks for the money behind it, 
uh, apart from the fact that you may not know enough to be able to train, it's still uh, the wrong reason for doing it because at the end of the day, this is, uh, I would say, helping and teaching at the same time. You're basically a teacher at the gym. So when you do it with passion and that passion comes from uh, your internal uh, part, I think it's kind of better uh, because you get an internal motivation and you're more likely to teach it better and you don't do it for the monetary value. But instead, you just want to teach the person how to lift and why and the benefits from it and what, uh, everything else. When in your personal training career did you decide or, or think that social media and producing digital content was going to be important for your growth and your brand? So I actually didn't. Uh, it never started as... It never started. Your no, Instagram I mean, account doesn't no, exist. No, I mean, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, my idea of growth on Instagram yeah. never was never there. I mm. just wanted to post. Like My first Instagram posts were just me shirtless with... Uh, Picture of me with abs, with long ass captions. You oh, are your best marketing. Yeah, are they still there? Because I yeah, they are. You have to go way back. We have <laughs> yeah, to go yeah, way yeah. back. So if I if I go scroll for fifteen minutes, I'll find those. Yeah, you can. Okay. And I never delete posts because I feel that even if they're wrong or bad, I still learn from there. Mm, like okay. it's like a, you can on my page you can find the growth, basically from point zero to where I got now, and um, yeah, I just want it was just for me at the beginning. I loved like studying stuff about this. And I was like, if I write things down, then I will not forget them. So if I need to look for anything, I would just go over a post, which I remember exactly what they are. So it's like your notes. Yeah, exactly. It's a page of notes. Then one day, randomly, I stumbled upon uh, on the App Store, which I never use, but that day, randomly, I picked it up and I stumbled upon a drawing uh, app. I downloaded it just, just to play around with it. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I would, I should start drawing things because I like drawing and teaching exercising. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I would just try it out, and it picked up from there. So are you? Are you drawing? Your illustrations are they're unique. It's yes. it's unlike anything else quite out there. And I think it does make Thank sense you. combining physique and and the ease and accessibility because you can get a lot out of it if you're very knowledgeable. But at the same time. You can understand it if you're if you're pretty new, right? It's laid out simply. Um, so you're are you hand drawing all yes. most of those illustrations? I hand draw everything of it. How long does that take you, like per per post? It really depends on whether I'm inspired and if I have an idea in mind. But since I'm very messy myself, sometimes I end up drawing every single day just because uh, I think of an idea just right before drawing it. So it can take me hours just because maybe I just don't like the way it looks or maybe like I put myself in the shoes of a follower. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, do I really like how the, this post look like? And am I getting the message as quick as an Instagram post goes? Like you're not spending too much time on an Instagram post. Let's be real. So you want to get the most out of it uh, very quickly. Otherwise you just scroll down to another one. So yeah, it can take me hours, even days, I would say, depending on what I'm talking about and whether or not I'm confident in sharing what I'm talking about. So yeah, that's the reason why I'm not able to post multiple times a day because it would be like, I got no life at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> so doubling the work would be impossible for me. And and they say, they say social media isn't a career. Listen... At, Kids at home, listen. You can be you can be a fine artist on Instagram, dude. It's and full of artists. Yeah, it, it's your your proof of it. I think it's really interesting, and I didn't really think of. I don't know what I assumed about your illustrations, and and we'll we'll embed some great examples of your posts um, in this podcast post on Barben, and we'll include them in the show notes, obviously. So wherever you're listening to this podcast at home. Um, you can get an example of of the awesome work on the page. I don't know what I assumed about the creation of these. Like for some reason, I, I just didn't think that there were hours and hours behind it. But hand drawing these very detailed illustrations of anatomy, 
I think it's unique to the space. Jake, have you seen anything quite like it? No, I definitely, and I like the consistency of it too. And it's like, I really like that you say like you don't delete stuff and it shows growth because my mind goes to like bigger articles we've written that we've gone back and updated based on like newer research suggestions and stuff like that. Change, change the citations, exactly. updated the more exactly. recent studies. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So I really like that. And yeah, I don't, I've seen other drawings out there, but nothing that flows as consistent as consistently and like highlights more complex things in an easy digestible way. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think makes it so unique. And honestly, I wanted to ask you, what posts do you usually see the most engagement on and why do you think that is? Ooh, good question. So um, the best posts, I believe, are the good posture, or I mean, good uh, execution of the exercise or bad execution of the exercise. Although if you mix that up with a meme, that's where uh, it explodes basically because you're like memes are very likable. Plus you're teaching something. So that's a good mix. And it generally shows like, for instance, I do the Drake meme of the, I don't want this, I want this. Mm -hmm. And that goes really well every time I post it. I think you get a mix the fun with the uh, uh, learning experience, that's where I think the most engagement gets there. So yeah, it's gotta be a post that it's not boring. I think that's the thing. Like I feel like there are many great pages out there, but if I have to scroll them and if I put myself on a follower shoes, then I'm like, okay, this post may be good or maybe tell me a lot of things, but it's so boring. It's like a freaking Instagram post and everything's written there. So yeah, yeah I may, I might I made as well just look, uh, read an article on Google or something. So you gotta pack it in a way that works for Instagram. So it obviously has to include some written part if you're drawing or something, but not too much. So it's gotta have the right flow of drawings and written content instead of just blasting it with words. Interesting. So when you started doing your drawings, how long did it take you to kind of figure that out between the balance of visual, written, and kind of bringing in more of the fun element? Because like from what you've talked about so far, what I'm learning, David, is combining things is the best thing. Yeah. Like com- when you combine multiple elements to create something great and beautiful, like mm-hmm. that's, I think, the best way to go, especially as social media continues to raise the bar on what we actually what actually earns our attention basically. So my, my question for you is throughout the growth of your page, you've grown with it. When did you start to like really start to notice like, okay, less text here is better or more visual here is better. It's like, how do you navigate that? Is it a case by case basis? Do you have like an idea in mind between like the balance of the two or how do you approach that? That's an interesting question. So back in the days when I started posting drawings, I would put the least amount of text. I just wanted to be drawings or maybe just even just a small line to explain something. But I've learned that as I'm growing the page, I would probably need more text, although I'm putting it very small and people complain about it. And I'm like, why don't you increase the size of the font or the text? And I'm like, because it hurts the drawing itself. Like if the font is too big, then there's not enough white space, I would say. So it's crowdy to the eye. And you kind of feel, I don't know, it's overwhelming when you look at it. So yeah, now I'm including more text probably because I'm talking about more complex stuff and the science behind it. So if it lacks context, then people are not really able to understand it correctly. So yeah, it's, it's funny because if you look uh, from my earliest posts, you would see less text and it's slowly picking up also because I feel like my audience is growing with me in a sense that they're uh, more prone to learning more scientific stuff and maybe even read a couple lines more, although it not always works. So there are posts that maybe I would spend days on and they just do too bad because they're probably either boring or there's too much text. Mm. So, But that's the beauty of social media. You just need to find the right tune of what you're able to create and pack it in such a way that it's not boring. Yeah. Who else in the fitness industry uh, do you admire as far as the content they're producing? Like you look at their their stuff and you go, "That's that's good. I like that." So I love Chris Beardsley's research reviews. Oh, Chris Beardsley, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. It's probably too nerdy, and 
It's 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 very nerdy. Yeah, it's and, very I, nerdy. and I know Chris, so this is not he, he can get mad. I'll call it very nerdy, but it's very I'm good. I'm kidding, Chris. <laughs> but yeah, I love his stuff a lot. I read all of his books, no, his articles, and I share a lot of his stuff because I I feel like I relate and it's evidence based. So that's what I like about him. It does it's not biased. Also I like Safi Cohen's stuff. She's very creative. We we've heard of her. So we, I guess yes. you have. We've done a thing yeah, or two, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think we know Steffi. Yeah, yeah most, <laughs> most likely, yeah. And obviously, uh, Jake is my buddy. Uh, who else? I, uh, I paid him to say this before he came on, by the way. This is, this, there's, this there's, pod- a, there's a low key, there's a shank right here, like in the link. Like. This podcast is sponsored by one of the hosts. It's sponsored by Jake. And he, he paid us to say all these nice things. I, I, flew him Thanks, in, I flew you in from Italy to come say that. That's an expensive plug, Jake. Dude, hey. You gotta pay for the quality. Yeah, yeah you, you gotta pay to play. <laughs> but yeah, also, aside from those, I love Lyle McDonald too. Lyle McDonald does really, really great stuff. Yeah. Very, very good. Man, those are my. Top ones, yeah. I remember being back in the day on the bodybuilding.com forums and reading some of Lyle's stuff when I just was getting started and it would make my head spin. I was like, <laughs> I don't understand any of this, but I, I think I like it. It is the best. Yeah. Chris, it's funny you mentioned Chris Beardsley because about, oh, this is going to date me. This was probably eight, seven or eight years ago when I first came across Chris and I was working at a different publication. This is well before Barbend was founded. And we were, we were working with Chris to, Help curate like a what I thought was going to be like a quarterly roundup of important research and strength and conditioning. I see. And I was someone connected me with Chris, and I was talking to him, and I was like, "Yeah, we want to do this like every three months, like have a roundup of in, important research and strength and conditioning, or evidence based research and strength and conditioning." And I asked him, and I was I was a little pessimistic. I was like, "Yeah, do you think there's going to be enough?" Like, do you think there's going to be enough to have a, a roundup every three months? And he's like, I can get you three roundups a week. And my mind was blown. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. He's like, yeah, I can like, we're, we're going to have to do this every week. So if like for a while we were publishing every week wow. a curated list of research that Chris found interesting. Some some studies bigger than others, some double blind, some not. Like, you know, it, it varied in, in quality, but it was all stuff that he was like, hey, if you want to stay on top of it, here's what's going on. Yeah, there's obviously going to be limitations for every study, so speaking, it is what it is. Speaking of studies, and this is something I actually want to touch on too, is I think there's a lot of beautiful parts of social media, especially on your page, but there's definitely got to be some times when people fire back, when especially when they can't, I think, separate the emotional from potentially the logical mm-hmm. or something that doesn't go with their bias. So speaking of research, that recent study on the hip thrust and squat, we wrote on that and we got some flack (laughs) and I don't understand exactly why per se. Let's clarify. Jake wrote on that. Yeah, I wrote on that. I covered it. I got some flack for it, and I saw that on your page you yeah, got some flack for it. And we, we got were, the opposite flack, though. We were we were talking about yeah, we were talking about this, and let's let's talk about the flack that we got and why and why people I think have trouble sometimes separating their own biases from the studies that are coming out, and how at the end of the day it's suggestions based off of experiential, exactly. but also evidence based practices that we mold together. So. Yeah, what are some examples of people firing back on you or just being like outright kind of like standoffish with content? The very interesting part is that on Barben, you get flack from people that are like, I only need to squat, I don't need anything else. So instead of being like, okay, maybe the squat is quote unquote better than a hip thrust, it's like, I don't need to hip thrust, I never did ever. Instead on my page, I got the opposite. (laughs) So while the study said that the squad might be superior to the hip thrust. I got people backlashing at me and being like, ah, with the hip thrust, I've got the best results. And most people don't know how to squat, so the hip thrust might be a better option. And sure, that might be the case. In fact, I didn't I didn't ever say that the squat you should just squat and the hip thrust suck. It just what the study said, the conclusion was that the squat may be a superior option if you want to grow your glutes, but never said that you should be just one or the other. Yeah. But that's what people assume. So yeah, it's just yeah, so a little, funny part of a social A little media. context there. It was the study comparing the hip thrust and squat, and basically they looked at both with actually a pretty good training intervention, in my opinion, yeah, I agree. and they compared muscle mass of the quads and glutes following 
pre and post the training intervention along with one RM strength. And basically they suggested that the squat had better carry over for the quads, which makes sense. You're moving the body through a greater range of motion. They're a prime mover for the squat. And it actually improved your one RM strength of the hip thrust. And it improved the glute and quad size versus the hip thrust, which showed that it improved the hip thrust, but it didn't necessarily have carry over to the squat. And while it did grow the glutes, the squat was as, as good as, was the as squat. good. Yeah. But it's like, I think people have trouble separating like the specificity of that movement exactly. versus like you're taking a compound versus an isolation movement. Like I, in my head as a coach, I'm comparing that. I'm like, okay, so it's like if we took like a preacher curl and compared it to a chin up, like obviously the chin up's going to have bigger carryover across the board. You're moving the body through a greater range. Right. You're probably exerting more effort doing so, especially if you're trying to go to a task failure versus something that's more isolation. But it was interesting seeing the feedback because, yeah, we had people coming at me like, what do you mean do both? The study says just squat. And it's like, <laughs> people, it's we're like, not like... Not at all what it said, actually. <laughs> exactly. It's like, we're taking what this says with the other research, which other research has seen, like the hip thrust can have some benefit. Like, Of course. Yeah, it can have some benefit, especially in younger populations for sprint mechanics, hip thrust, L hip extension, or strength, and, the and so group forth. group of women that don't want to necessarily grow their quads, although the hip thrust will still grow your quads, not as much as the squats. But yeah, if you want to create hypertrophy just for your glutes, then you may want to pick the hip thrust or yeah. the squats. Yeah, or if you're looking to to work your quads and glutes and reduce axial spinal loading or something yeah. like yeah, that. That's like true. For some people, they might right. be working on an injury or just trying to reduce that, some that load. Some people may even just find a barbell on their shoulders to be like too heavy or not able to actually hold it, yeah. probably due to the musculature of their upper back or whatever. Yeah. Well, it's it just so funny because like I love the like the differences of the folks who came at me and then the folks who came yeah, at you on your too. page. And it's like somebody came at me for like the suggestion of being like, oh, well, what do you mean? Like it's not gonna have equal, care. I, I said basically like they're gonna have different carryovers because you're axial loading versus like a horizontal loading. Like it's a different way of loading the body. It's not gonna have direct carryover, especially when you're looking for strength in a specific movement. But then you had people coming at you saying like, what do you mean hip thrust isn't good? And you're like, I never said that. I just said, <laughs> I'm my, just showing the study. In my mind, <laughs> I like to think of this as a great American-European divide. <laughs> I know it's not the case. I know your page, uh, Eugen has like a, a followers around the globe and, and Barbin has, we have readers around the globe, but I like to think that Europeans are just like defending the hip thrust to the death <laughs> and Americans are just defending the squat to the death. And there's this like cross the Atlantic Ocean just back and forth about it. That's not the case. I think it's most... Uh, um, it's mostly about uh, depending on the niche we're talking about. Like there are more power lifters that are proud of the squat and they would die if uh, they're die hard fans of the squat. And it's good, but probably not everybody should squat because you never know uh, whether they lack technique or right. they just don't feel comfortable doing it's it. A tough, it's, a, it's a tougher movement. It's yeah, a it's it, more complex. Yeah, and that's, for sure. And that's, yeah, that's a whole other argument. Like when we had Jordan Shallow and Dr. Pat Davidson and we were talking about the squat a little bit and it's like, yeah, not everybody needs to squat. A lot of people can get really fucking strong, uh, really strong without actually squatting. And it's just, Absolutely. it's just so ironic. But another thing to consider too is every comment we got on our article was from a guy. Men were very much like, you need to squat. And I think what we were talking about a little bit on your page, it was almost the opposite, right? Exactly. It, yeah. was, it was women who were coming at you for the hip thrust. Yeah. So that's another, like I think, contextual difference that people aren't considering and taking into the greater context of what the study said versus what we were actually suggest, like, what we were suggesting. Yeah, I, I wanted to just publish it because I believed it was a very well done study. It was blinded. Uh, the measure, measurements were, weren't done uh, through EMG which is what they typically do. Also, the squat was made sure that it was to full depth, which I even assumed before um, necessarily having the study on deck, I would assume that the squat may be a better option just because of the mechanics of it and the stretching of the muscle under load, under what, what load. But yeah, now we have one, one study that confirms it. It's one, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, opposed to many other ones, but still, it's something to consider. Why and not? I think, I think what is also cool about that study is one, it was done on women, which yeah. I think is very cool. Trained because women, trained women, like four or five years of experience each, and I think that's a very understudied population. Yeah. So I think that that, within its own right, made that study unique in the sense of like, this is really cool to consider into the greater picture, folks. Mm -hmm. Like, we're talking trained women who are already an understudy population. Like, we should be celebrating that they went for this demographic versus your typical like untrained, maybe collegiate 
yeah, person who true. will well, have totally different adaptations. One critique could be that probably uh, with that level of experience, you should be having a stronger hip thrust. So that may be one critique, but you never know. Yeah. yeah, and that's why we need more studies across different populations sure. with the same exactly. variables and, and controls accounted for. But it's a start. It's an interesting. Exactly. It's an interesting start to the conversation. Mm-hmm. It's not an endpoint. Yeah, it's not against anybody. Right. At the end yeah. of the day, it just gives you some context on how to program your exercise. Nobody said that you should only do head thrusts or squats. It depends on your goal. You could even just never squat at all. Even if you want to grow your quads, it doesn't matter. You don't have to do one specific exercise. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think people miss that. It's the combining of the experiential evidence with the best practices versus like when they were published and suggestions and then molding those together. Yeah. That's why I think strength coaching is so cool. It's because you have your pillars of things that you always need to follow to get certain things accomplished and just to do things the correct way in the sense of like how we load folks, how we kind of progress them into different movement patterns and so forth. But it's up to you to interpret that. And that's what I think makes good coaches so good. It's that they have figured out how to do that and make it in a way that gets results for a lot of folks based on the context of their situation. So Most definitely. Well, I, I, I think the most important factor for being a good coach is your ability to take selfies in a gym bathroom mirror. With long descriptions. With long descriptions. Otherwise, the workout doesn't even count. It, it, it never happened. <laughs> yeah, true. But, I, do, I, do have one more, I do have one more actual serious <laughs> question on that note. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned... Several times, I think it's so cool that you treat it like this. Your posts are a history, yes, and they are notes, and they are a history of how your your thinking and approach has evolved. Are there any examples that you can kind of remember off the top of your head? Because I'm I'm sure I'm assuming they exist. Where you posted about a concept and a, a take on a concept, it could be something anatomical, it could be something movement related, it could be a specific training adaptation or stimulus, and since you posted that, due to feedback, additional yes. research, your opinion has changed. For sure. Um, this may be uh, the deadlift ones and the low back pain. Uh, back in the days, I would assume that perfecting your technique may allow you to not experience back pain, while instead the new research shows that it's not necessarily related to uh, tissue. So there are countless of people who can deadlift with a rounded back and still not experience anything bad. There's countless of people and about 30% of population that has herniated discs or at least bulging discs and don't experience any low back pain at all. So that's not that's just a normal part of um, uh, tissue that ages over time. Uh, but yeah, that has changed. In fact, um, while I still teach at that lift in such a way that maximizes the use of the right muscles that should be targeted while executing the exercise, it's not that any degree of flexion of the spine is going to be bad. So yeah, that has changed. For instance, I remember posting about the stuff that um, maybe any uh, flexion of the spine may be bad, while instead now it's completely changed. That's, I think it's a really good, like, specific example. That yeah, for sure. Most people who, no matter kind of your level of training, most people listening to this podcast have an awareness of the deadlift. Yeah. So I really appreciate using that example because it's 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 kind of easy to understand. It. It's mm-hmm. very easy to to visualize uh, what what you might have assumed was like the correct form, yes. and then differentiations from the correct form that that may not be as catastrophically bad exactly. as we once thought. Yeah. I think that's really cool too. It shows that you're growing as a professional. And I think uh, some people fall into the trap of trying to stick to their guns so much that they almost limit mm-hmm. the potential that they have to that's grow. That's guru mentality, I believe. That's, yeah, that's when true. When people are not able to admit they've made a mistake, I'm not scared of making mistakes. That's the only way I'm going to learn. So if I know, like, I obviously... I never said that I know everything. I just try my best to share good stuff on my page. But yeah, I don't know everything. I make mistakes too. And if I do, I just try to learn and learn as much as I can on the topic and then just publish different things that may be more current or research-based. So yeah, I never, um, I'm never scared of saying, yo, I made a mistake. It's yeah, not a part of me. Did that? Did you always have that though, or did you have to kind of grow into that mindset? I think yeah, I had to grow into the mindset just because when uh, you're a young gun and just 
in the first years, your level of confidence is skyrocketing because you just learn a couple of things and you think you know most of the things, but the more you learn, the more you learn that you don't know. So yeah, I think with more knowledge, you just become more, uh, how do I say it? Like less uh, impulsive yeah. in a sense. Mm. So yeah. It's a Dunning-Kruger effect, right, David? That's what it's called? Like the, yeah, I think like so. Like the heightened idea that you know it and then the moment yeah, you then like, it goes down. Yeah, it goes down over time. That's really interesting because I think I had a lot of that too when I first started at Barbin, but I think mine was almost the opposite. Like I was almost like paralyzed by n- knowing like how much I didn't know and I was almost afraid to kind of yeah, admit, that's very common too. admit at times like I could be wrong or what if this doesn't appeal to everybody? And that's a question I want to actually talk on really fast is when you design your posts, we talked on this a little bit last night about how I think you and I both went through a phase where we thought we had to be liked by everybody and mm-hmm. it limits your content creation. I think especially as an artist, it can really limit you. So how did you kind of work around that mindset of like, or tell yourself or work around like, hey, I don't need to be liked by everybody. I'm going to put out the best damn thing I can based on what I know and what I see. And if people don't agree to some extent, that's okay. Like, How did you work around that? Yeah, I you always think- want to agree to disagree at one point. So... Good question. I think um, at one point you realize that you just cannot know everything, especially at a young age, and you try your best to put out the best content possible within your abilities. And you don't want to get paralyzed by that idea because there are times uh, in which you probably um, try to create something, but then you wonder whether or not it's good. You do more research and it's the research is controversial in a sense. It kind of confirms what you're talking about, but then you find some research that it doesn't. Then you know people who uh, support your idea and people who don't. But that if that paralyzes you, you're more likely not to post anything at all, which I think is worse than just maybe trying. Although it, yeah, it depends on uh, your reach and what you're talking about because that could still hurt if you're yeah. just posting nonsense, nonsense content, but that's not the case for me, I believe. So yeah, at one point, I think you just got to stop um, caring about other people's opinion because you will never be able to satisfy everybody. Because like we said, um, on the deadlift, if there's uh, more research that supports the idea that not any degree of flexion is bad, but it's rather a range of neutrality that you want to keep your spine in, you will, you will definitely find people that will say, no, any degree of flexion is bad. Although they are not supported by research or, and it's just personal experience too. Like whatever people feel pain doing anything that may uh, come with the technique they're performing, they would say, no, I feel pain. So this, this goes against what I'm experiencing. So it's not right. For instance, I'm that case. So yeah, you you will never make everything happy, and you just gotta live with it. I think you you just want to try and do your best of your abilities and just keep growing. I think that's that's my idea. I think that's that's wise advice within the fitness industry and and beyond. To, <laughs> to be honest, we got we got really existential and, and high concept I'm with sorry. this. No, no, it's good. It's good. So wait, I have actually. I want to ask you, David. Did you ever have that when you started Barbend? I've never asked you this. Did you ever have the like kind of like issue to stumble around like trying to please everybody with the content you were producing? Because you did like what five hundred articles in six months before bringing on anybody to help out and like for full time at least. Like, how did you approach that? And did you have that, Jake? You work with me every. You work with me every single day. Like we 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 publish articles on the weekends. You you know in your heart of hearts that I still wrestle with that issue <laughs> I mean, on a daily does. basis. Everybody yeah, does. and I think actually I'm glad I'm, I am glad you asked. This was, that was a good question, and I, I, I'm I'm touched that you asked. But I actually um, I think framing it as when Barben started versus now, it's gotten more acute in some ways. Because when Barben started, we were a blog. We weren't. We we know we didn't have millions of readers a month. We weren't the official media partner of USA Weightlifting. We weren't like, you know, Barbin started and a year and a half later. You and I were doing color commentary at the World Weightlifting Championships, you know, like in an official capacity. That was pretty insane growth and quicker than I ever imagined. And we reached more people faster than I ever imagined. Have we grown as fast as we would like in some 
arenas? No, I think we've grown slower than I would like in some arenas. Same, I, I think I'd, I'd ask you the same thing and you'd probably agree, right? Um, but as we've grown and as we've reached higher levels of legitimacy and acceptance within different parts of the fitness community and the fitness industry, I think I felt more and more aware the of, pressure. of the pressure and yeah. the disagreement. So when someone, like I read responses on articles and social media posts now more than I ever did the first year Barbend was around because I know more people are reading them and more people whose opinions I value. I can totally relate. Are reading them. Yeah. So it's like now it's more, it's like, okay, we've, we've made it. Now there's more pressure. Now there's more pressure. It's a tough balance because now there's more to do. So I can't read every comment on an Instagram post. There are thousands a day. Yeah. But I feel that pressure in, in a different in a different way because it's like the next time I go to an event and I see someone I really respect, you know, they're going to say like, "Why didn't you respond to? Why that didn't you respond true. to that comment four weeks ago <laughs> that I that I left on a post from two years ago?" It's like, Dude, come on, man! I you know what am I supposed to do here? I can totally relate to this. It gets more uh, yeah, like you actually feel more pressure because you know that more people are looking at mm-hmm. it, so you just unconsciously want to please everybody, mm-hmm. although you can't because there are obviously different ideas even on the of the giants of the industry. Yeah. So there's if there's disagreement there, there's certainly gonna be uh, on lower levels. So yeah, but the more you grow, I think the more you're gonna be experienced in this because you just wanna do a better job of what you're doing. So it's normal, I believe. You just gotta get used to this. I think the best thing we can do as content producers in the fitness space is to highlight our own, our, our personal growth. And I think the difficulty that Barbend has with that, Jake, and I think something we can get better at as a, as a team here at Barbend. And you know, if you're listening to this podcast, if you're watching this podcast, because we're, we're filming it for YouTube, you're only seeing part of the Barbend team. You might see a lot of Jake and I on camera, but our team is much bigger. Our it, like full-time team is, is much bigger than just me and Jake. Um, even though, unfortunately, you, you hear us a lot <laughs> if you listen to this podcast. We can all get better at sharing a bit of our personal growth in producing this content, sharing when our personal ideas, approaches to content creation, to research, to working with experts, change and grow because the brand, a brand can become faceless, right? Like physique can become faceless exactly. if you don't put your personality in there. Barbend can become faceless if we don't put our personality and our personal growth in there. You have to give people a little bit of insight into your personal journey and what's behind the brand. Otherwise, you're going to seem like this monolith that never adapts and never responds to criticism and never responds to change. And I feel like that's a recipe for disaster in the fitness space. I truly do. Yeah, I agree. 100%. That's very interesting. I think I didn't do a good job at sharing my personal stuff. I just, I don't know, like um, I'm mostly posting drawings. Actually, I'm just posting drawings except for a couple of posts, maybe it can be my birthday or some special event that I'm doing in which I feel like I need to talk about. So yeah, my business is more of a faceless business, Mm -hmm. although I don't think it's a bad thing because then more people can work on it and it can still remain the way it is. So yeah, I agree with the fact that it's better to share your struggles and uh, behind the scenes of what's going on. So yeah, it's definitely a good insight. It's a tough balance because it's not what people are always coming to you for, but it's something that you also want to highlight and, and make aware if people want to learn more about that. So exactly. um, it's a tough balance and finding cool ways to do that. It's something we're always going to be working on. It really has. And I think especially as media continues to change and social media presences continue to grow, I think people are a lot more likely these days to connect to personalities versus brands. And yeah. I think that we talk about that often. It's like, how do we integrate personality with a brand that is also professional. Mm -hmm. That's very tough to do. Um, I mean, that's why you see some of the older fitness websites, like they've kind of fizzled out because I don't think they have a lot of personality to them, a lot of spunk. And I mean, if you don't adapt to the changes, like with how social media is now highlighting so much of personality Mm -hmm. with content, learning and everything else, it can be very troublesome. So I think like anybody listening, for example, who wants to build their business or their brand or their like personal or their personality basically on social media, it's like finding that line between 
how you want to convey your message, but also let people in, like let them see like, hey, you're a person too. Because yeah. I think there's too much in both directions and finding that line I think can be very powerful. Yeah, a brand has to be bigger than a person. That's why you have a brand, right? But the two have to work in tandem to build each other up, right? Like a brand needs should ideally be set up to where a bunch of different personalities can help it and the brand lifts up those personalities above and beyond what they would have individually. It's it, it's something we're going to be working on for a long time, probably forever. Yeah. Probably forever yeah, and it's happened. it's it's um it's something that is not it's probably not unique to the fitness industry, although that's what we work in. So yeah. that's what we what we can talk about. But um, yeah, it's that's that was a great question, Jake, and I appreciate you asking because it, it definitely opens up some thoughts that I, I haven't talked about on the podcast at least. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think it's interesting because, like, I don't know. For me personally, like, I see you as like the oracle of like content Ooh, creation. Please. Come on, don't use <laughs> no, the o, don't oh, use yeah. the o we're, word. We're on a live <laughs> no. we're on a live podcast. Uh-uh. I'm putting you on the spot. Uh-uh. Hey. But I think it, I, yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's an interesting concept, especially as the brand has grown, trying to navigate that and figure it out. And I like I, we were talking about that last night too. And I feel like I love like the facelessness of physique because it is all inclusive. But I do think people would be happy to see you a little bit more and let like let people in a little bit more into like what's going on, your training, how you've yeah. grown. Like I think that's really cool. And you're such a you're such like just meeting you. I met you in person for the first time this morning, uh, Eugene. You're such a happy guy. Like you lifted my spirits up. Really? Yeah. It was like <laughs> it was like I was like a like a big smile. Like I don't. It was it was cool. It was yeah, cool. Um, I like to be a positive guy. Yeah. I don't want to be you, like that. You, you have that good like you have a very good personal energy. It's fun being in the room with you. Thank you. I can't say that about everyone in this room, Jake. No, I'm kidding. I'm absolutely <laughs> no, that's right. so, catch me on a morning without coffee and nobody wants to talk to me. You can tell like we our office like our desks are all set up with like the barbin team. And when I'm on the couch or I'm sitting away from everybody, it's like eh, don't interact with Jake yeah, today. It's, he's it's, not it's actually very true. He's not a happy camper. It's actually very true. <laughs> But I dude, see. I appreciate you coming on. I think that pretty much wraps thank up our talk. Do you, have, me. do you have any other questions, David, while we're on? No, it's it's a real pleasure to, it, thank you for coming in. I have to say, this is the longest anyone, coming all the way from Italy is by far the longest anyone has traveled to join the Barben podcast. That is amazing. And I know I know that's all you're doing. I know you literally just well, booked the flight just for this course, recording. No, he I, actually I booked, booked the, the flight. flight. I'm he's, joking. He's going back home in two hours. Yeah. I've got my plug. Now I'm good. We just I got what just, I paid for. Just so it's clear to <laughs> listeners, this we're only mildly joking here. But <laughs> no, I really do appreciate you you coming. I'm obviously a huge fan of what you do. It's been uh, great getting to know your work, and I hope that uh, I hope that we can work together a lot more in the future. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here, and it's uh, my first time having a doing a live podcast. But it's thanks to you guys. It's been very. Uh, a pleasure experience. They're right. all they're all a lot more fun than this. This is this is the the worst podcast experience you'll ever have. You go on Actually, anyone else's podcast. Fun. Oh, it's very all fun. uphill from here. No, oh, man. <laughs> Before we go, where can people find you? Tell us where to follow you. I, if we haven't said it enough throughout this podcast, I where? mean, you can find me uh, mostly on Instagram, uh, it, where, which is where I'm the most active. It's physique spelled B H E A S Y Q U E, and that's pretty much it. Sounds good. And we'll obviously drop that down below in the actual article for this podcast and within the notes. But until next time, thank you so much for coming in, man. Thank you for having me. Peace out.